Welcome. It's time for the further adventures of Indiana Jones. The greatest adventures of all time. I don't know, I'm making this up as I go. Pack your bag, grab your passport, and prepare to go globetrotting with Marvel Comics' classic four-color adventures of Indiana, Indiana Jones. Jones. Jones? Jones! Mr. Jones, I've heard a lot about you, sir. Your appearance is exactly the way I imagined. <laughs> <laughs> Turn off. I'm here now. What do you want to talk about? Welcome, IndieCast listeners, to the further adventures of Indiana Jones. I'm Joe Stuber. Joining me, as always, is Keith Voss. Hey, Keith. Hey, Joe. Hey, further fans. What's going on? Got lots to talk about this week. Keith is now basking in the glow after having produced uh, The Gold Goddess Part 2. Nice job by both uh, oh, you, and, uh, you know, and Rob McGee. Yeah, Excellent hey, job on that. Big thanks to everybody involved. It sounds great. We're really happy with it. Hope everybody enjoys it. Um, if you guys get a chance, just let us know what you think. Any thoughts, any suggestions, so drop on by. Let us know what you think about Gold Goddess Part 2. Enjoyed listening to that. And I actually followed up your comic book adventures at Comic-Con with uh, some comic book adventures of my own. Yes, you did. Interesting. And uh, you also followed up on a suggestion I had for you for that. Convention. Yeah, just real briefly. Went to Cincinnati and uh, got a chance to meet the legendary Jim Steranko. And uh, I wasn't sure what to take. I took a couple things out there for him to sign. Had a Captain America poster, but I uh, wasn't sure if I should take the Raiders of the Lost Ark board game with me. And try well, being that, take- and I still don't understand this to this day, why they haven't made prints of those uh, original Storenko uh, pieces of artwork. Yeah, I mentioned one of the guys that was with him said that uh, there, there are only two in existence uh, of those prints, and he said George Lucas owns one and Jim owns the other, so... Somebody had a bootleg uh, version of it there, but he mentioned about the board game, and I had it there. I said, well, you know, the only thing uh, that's different is they took the uh, the cigarette out of Indy's mouth. And I said, maybe I should have him uh, pencil one in there for me. And he said, you know what? He might do it. And sure enough, uh, I now have an original piece of Steranko art on my <laughs> on my Raiders of the Lost Ark board game. He drew the Steranko little... cigarette. <laughs> he drew Amazing. the cigarette in and drew some uh, little, little puffs of smoke coming out. According to this repeated nationwide survey, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. So that was pretty cool. He's a, great, he's a great guy. And uh, what we want to do now is get back into uh, the groove. We had our uh, comic book adventures at Comic-Con, uh, the last segment. But we want to pick up here with issue three and... Uh, Man, Club Obi Wan is packed tonight. That's all I have to say. It's busy in Club Obi Wan, huh? We're, and we're turning away reservations when, at this point. It, yeah, it all <laughs> seems to be when we uh, we started reviewing issue three. Everybody came out of the woodwork. Well, it was good because uh, sort of one interview led to another, one contact led to another, and what, what we want to do is we we've, we want to get right to it because we've got three, actually four uh, interviews coming up. We had a two for on the last one. We really want to give the the listeners a flavor of what it was like for this book to come together. Uh, so we were able, especially to... especially in the beginning. Of the book, yeah, you know, as we're starting this segment, we've we, so we've got a lot of interviews coming up. So you know, if you need to pause and come back to it later, that's fine. But we wanted to get these all in now before we get into you know into our review of issue three. But uh, we've got Joe Duffy, uh, who was the editor on the the original Raiders of the Lost Ark adaptation comic. Uh, we also have uh, the writer of issue number three that we're currently reviewing, uh, Denny O'Neill, is going to be coming up. And also uh, Walter and Louise Simonson. Uh, Walt uh, is actually adds a little bit of flavor to the interview he did with Mitch uh, back in 112. But we contacted Louise Simonson to talk about her time editing Further Adventures, and Walt was right there. So <laughs> we asked him to, yeah. to sort of jump in uh, on the interview as well. So we've got all those coming up. Uh, that we want to get to. Um, unfortunately, you, yeah, unfortunately, yeah, you wish... were the red line was traveling. I know you had yeah. uh, lacrosse games and a lot of things going on as we were doing these interviews and setting them up. But you were able Time to difference all that stuff. I mean, I, I wish I could have been in on these three interviews, but I'm with you on a few upcoming. And let me tell you, they are dynamite interviews. But you were able to, to to feed me some questions too as you were going through your travels. So I so you did the heavy heavy lifting last time. I'll take the I'll take the chores this time. And uh what do you say? Let's head into Club Obi Wan for our chat with Joe Duffy. Hold on, hold on, I'm getting my tux ready. Well, we're sitting down here with Joe Duffy, writer, editor, and owner-publisher of Armin Armadillo Books. Joe, welcome to the IndieCast. Hey, 
glad to be here. I love what you've done with the place. <laughs> well, we thank you for joining us. And uh, before we talk about your time uh, on Raiders of the Lost Ark, the adaptation, which was uh, certainly one of my favorite books growing up, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, the early days, how you broke into the business? Well, I became a comics fan when I was a kid because my older brother, Maliki Duffy, uh, was just a crazy mad comics fan himself, and I trusted his judgment excessively. So I spent my childhood and then my adolescence and some of my college years reading comic books. And when I finished school, I applied to Marvel and figured, well, how could they do without a great writer like me? But, of course, what they needed was an office drone. I took an office drone job, loved to have it, got to know how the business worked, met a bunch of incredible people, and just nagged, whined, and cried for uh, a chance to try my hand at writing until a couple of months later they broke down. And by the way, I think that's pretty typical of how uh, many comic book writers and artists get started. And, uh, you know, especially back in the dark ages before there was an Internet or even fax machines and FedEx. It's like if you were there, you worked in the office, you learned what you were doing, you got the job, and uh, life was good. And I was already at Marvel, although just barely, when they started doing the adaptation of uh, the first Star Wars movie. And, oh, my gosh, I just fell crazily, madly in love with Star Wars the way I already was with superheroes and eventually became the writer on the Star Wars book for Marvel and, and did that job for just years and years, had a great time doing it. And uh, I was a Marvel editor uh, for about 10 years, and during a lot of that time, I worked with the late, great Archie Goodwin, and Archie was the editor in charge of the uh, Star Wars movie adaptations, and therefore also became the editor in charge of uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And as his second in command, I worked with him on that and helped him with all of the trafficking, proofreading, and getting it all done. What was life like in, uh, at Marvel during the late 70s when all this uh, the Star Wars mania hit? It was a great time. Um, I've got to say, nobody was making more than two nickels at the time. Um, this was before comic book companies were in the habit of paying royalties or incentives, You know, meaning in addition to whatever you got for doing the work, you got a little bit more if it sold a little better. The little bit more if it sold a little better hadn't happened yet, so everybody who was doing it was doing it solely for the love of the art and, uh, okay, maybe for a shot at being famous, I've heard with some people, and just for the chance to work with these characters you loved and do great work with uh, often absolutely terrific people. And when the Star Wars uh, mania hit, it's really funny. The morning the first movie opened, Chris Claremont, who did not have an editorial job at that time, went to see it. And then came into the office and told everybody all about it. So that was it. We were all determined to see it as soon as we could. And again, my brother Maliki and I were lucky enough to get tickets to see it that night because the buzz hadn't really started yet. And um, that was it. I was just in love, insanely in love with Star Wars uh, because this was just about the time home video had come out. But... It was not widely available, and you did not know if you'd ever see a movie again after it left the theaters. We went to see that movie every Friday after work for months, and I saw it at least 20 times in the theaters, frequently twice in one night. You know, I'd sit through two shows of it and just didn't think I could ever possibly get enough of Star Wars. And it was that way for a lot of my friends. When did you jump onto the book itself? Roy Thomas, who I believe wrote the first movie adaptation and who was a friend of George Lucas's, um, was on the book, and it looked like he would be continuing on the book as a regular creator. But there was always the chance that somebody was going to be late or pages would fall down a well. You know, again, technology being what it was at the time, Things were not routinely copied until they were completed. So if a work in progress was damaged, that was it. So they were in the habit of always having an extra issue or two in the drawer in case the worst happened. And the deal with these extra issues were, because you never knew when you might need them, they had to be absolutely self-contained and not touch 
the continuity of the narrative. And I just agitated and cried until Archie Goodwin um, gave me assignments to do two self-contained fill-in issues, uh, one of which was the Ben Kenobi in his youth adventure, you know, long before I knew what episode one, et cetera, would be all about. Mm -hmm. But I think ran as issue 24 and was drawn by Carmine Infantino. And the other was my first collaboration with Carrie Gamble, who eventually I worked with for years on the superhero title Power Man and Iron Fist. That was the Stenax Shuffle. And that one, nobody needed a fill-in. There were no scheduling problems. And the Stenax Shuffle actually wound up being run at the beginning of my run on the regular series. And the, the way I got the regular series was that it was supposed to be Denny O'Neill's assignment. And I think he was a little overbooked at the time and kept not quite getting to Star Wars. And I believe at that point his uh, editor was Louise Simonson, who was a good friend of mine and incredibly tolerant. And she kept saying, okay, Joe, you could do an issue. Okay, Joe, you could do an issue. Okay, Joe, we'll run your fill-in issue. And finally, she just went to Denny and said, you're never going to have the time to do Star Wars, are you? And uh, so that was how I became the regular writer on Star Wars. I was just supposed to be vamping until Denny was ready to step up, and my vamping turned into my job. Did you have a chance to deal directly with uh, folks at Lucasfilm? Um, on Star Wars, I did not. Um, generally, they spoke to the editor, not the writer, because, you know, at Marvel, the creators work for the editor, although they're the ones who do the, the actual work, and the editor is the one answerable to the company. So, of course, the conversation was not George Lucas to me. It was George Lucas would say something to somebody who worked for his company. The person who worked for his company would say something to the person who worked for Marvel, the company, who would then say to me, okay, Joe, you know, Fred says that George says that you should or you shouldn't or you have or we like or maybe you should think about never again. And, you know, so I got it pretty directly, but it always came through at least two other people. And then it wasn't too long after that that you heard about Raiders of the Lost Ark. What – describe that situation and how that all played out with you coming onto that the adaptation as well. Well, what happened with Raiders is – by that time, I had left my work editing superheroes. Archie um, had become um, part of a new division at Marvel. Marvel had previously only published properties that the company owned, and you know, like Spider-Man, The Fantastic Four, Daredevil, um, and also movie adaptations or things like Conan, which remained the property of an outside licensor, and Marvel was just doing the comics for them, although they continued to own the character. Epic was the first time that Marvel published something where the creators owned it, and the company merely published it for them, and Archie was in charge of Epic, and, oh, talk about busy and overbooked, so, you know, tra-la-la-la-la, guess what, you get one other editor to help you, because, you know, we haven't figured out how to clone you yet, and that was me, and because Archie had a great relationship with Lucasfilm by that point. He was in charge of any Lucasfilm movie adaptation was going to be done by Archie, and therefore um, all the overflow work from Archie, we, we, he was in charge, but we absolutely did it together. And suddenly what we had was, we're going to be doing this adaptation, you know, we, can give you, we could give you these superb images, we've got some photographs, and here's the script. So Raiders with us started with, okay, it's another Lucasfilm project, but it is not, you know, be, but it is not Star Wars. It's something entirely new. Read the script and we'll get going on it. Mm -hmm. I don't recall which of us read the script first, but I can tell you we read it, you know, pretty much what, or we may have even traded pages back and forth. Again, photocopying technology was a luxury then. You didn't just run something off in the machine in 10 minutes. So, you know, we had the one copy of the script, and we backed and forked it. And I can remember clearly laughing my head off, because until you see the amazing uh, action sequences, on the page, what comes across is Indy tries something. He fails. He gets beaten up. And I was just laughing my head off. I was like, oh, my gosh, this guy fails and fails and fails. And then Archie said, 
yes, but then God steps in and saves them. <laughs> and then he added, God is my hitman, and we were both on the floor laughing. And it isn't really until you see the movie that you realize that he doesn't fail, he just gets beaten up. And his triumph is, they cannot beat this guy up enough. He whines and complains and then gets up and keeps on going. And that is why he wins. And, of course, the other thing is the ways that he almost gets killed are some of the most spectacular action sequences to this day. They set the standard. And back then, this was not done on the computer, by and large. Some of it was. But a lot of it was real guys or models or what have you. You know, the computer technology we take for granted now was in its infancy and being invented then to do this stuff. And it was, you see these amazing set pieces out of your mind with excitement and the spectacle. But on the page, we just laugh because it's like Indy tries, they hit him, he fails, he drops the thing, it falls through the cracks, the spiders go after him. <laughs> and, um, well, that was the thing we had talked about that must have been difficult at the time of not, well, within the confines of, of, a, of a three issue series uh, as well, but trying to get all that action. Onto the page, we noticed uh, several of the scenes were really shortened. Uh, you know the uh, you know the truck chase and things like that. Some things were different than we saw in the movie. Some things were left completely out, like the Arab well, swordsman. Some of those things hadn't been done yet when we got our script. Mm -hmm. In order to have this out in time for the release of the movie, the movie was still being worked on. I could tell you that um, our friends at Lucasfilm at the point that we were working on this, had no idea what was going to come out of the arc. I can remember clearly, because as I said, this was a case where I was working with Lucasfilm, and they came into the office. And we sat down, and Archie said, what do we tell our artists and our writer at this point? In the script it says, you know, the night comes alive with glory. That's what it said in the script. That whole amazing sequence, you know, with the Nazis playing with the the remains of the tablets and then the beauty and none of that was in there. The night comes alive with the glory was the entirety of what was in the script we saw. So we started trying to probe and say, well, what's going to happen? And they said, well, we don't know yet, but we can tell you it'll be amazing. So we worked with what we had. Remember the Arab swordsman, Harrison Ford himself tells the story that that kind of happened that day on the set. It was just going to be one more guy fighting Indy, and I don't know if it was in the script we saw. But, you know, he, why did he shoot the guy? Because he had a stomach flu and he could not stand to do a fight. And, it's again, it's a seminal and brilliant moment in film. But it wasn't there when we started work. Yeah. We had uh, talked about that, I think, uh, in one of uh, Mitch's, uh, Mitch Halleck's recent interviews with uh, Jim Shooter. He had mentioned that, I think at some point a rough cut was brought in or some footage was brought in, but I don't think, I don't think your team had everything to look at. Do you, do you recall seeing any footage or anything that was brought in at Absolutely any point? Absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely not. We saw a handful of photographs. We got enough photographs that we, we saw the artifacts. We got a, pictures of some early scenes. Uh, but, you know, a lot of the, the brilliance and the whimsy I don't know how much of that was rewrites, how much of it was done on set. You know, little things like the infamous torture implement that turns out to be a coat hanger, which is one of my favorite parts of the movie. It's like, how do you, how do you put that into a comic book? You know, it, it would take so many frames for that joke to come across. That's something that is pure cinema. And, you know, the truck chase you talked about, trust me, a car chases, by and large, do not make good comic books. They, they are purely cinematic. You actually have to see the movement. On a comic book, it's a picture of a truck. Picture of a truck with a different background. Picture of a truck from a different angle. Comics do certain things really well. Car chases are not one of them. Let's talk a little bit about the artwork because that's been a, a source of contention on, on some of the, the segments we've had uh, regarding Busima's artwork. Uh, a genius uh, in the comic book industry, legendary. The artwork he uh, had on the Raiders adaptation, depending on who you talk to, some some like it, some don't. Give me your thoughts. Well, 
Okay, first of all, John Bisama is one of my favorite artists who ever lived. He was one of the best guys I ever worked with, and he always headed any project I did where I had to say he headed my list of artists we're going to go to. And um, I think he did his usual fine job on this stuff. People, people are entitled not to like it if it's not to their taste. But the fact is, I think he did a wonderful job on that stuff. We didn't know what most of it was going to look like. You know, he'd seen pictures of some of the characters, and uh, we had been told what they would be doing. But he had to do a lot of that from his head, and I think he did an amazing job. I'm not absolutely sure that he and Klaus Janssen were the best artistic combination I've ever seen. I think they're both tremendous artists. And, for example, Klaus's work on uh, Sal Buscema, John's brother, whose style is remarkably similar, is some of the best artwork I've ever seen. But I am not sure that they were necessarily the best possible team for this work. But remember, nobody knew that this thing was going to turn out to be the second biggest thing to Star Wars, you know, that it was going to be so absolutely phenomenal and brilliant. And going with an artist who doesn't just do superheroes, who also does incredible human beings out of tights and does great action sequences and can make, you know, somebody rappelling down um, a cable or, you know, being in a truck and fighting somebody incredibly exciting, you know, doesn't need the, the tights and the ray guns or the, uh, the blasters and the, the power of flight to make it all work. John is absolutely, he, he was absolutely my choice for this kind of work. And um, it's funny, Lucasfilm, uh, they liked the work, but we would get, we did get some complaints from them, but you would laugh if you knew what they were. You know, um, somebody complained about an actor likeness, but it was never Indiana or Marion. Somebody complained about like a completely minor character. Well, you know, he looks kind of fat here. And it's like, okay, we'll get him drawn thinner. You know, well, her bosom doesn't look like the actress's bosom. Well, most actresses like it if we, if we give them a little bit more up top. I'm, I assure you it probably wasn't intentional anyway. No complaints from Karen to, Allen? Yeah. <laughs> you know, but believe it or not, those were the kind of silly things. And I don't mean silly as in I respect them, but... You know, I know comics fans are, well, he's the wrong artist, and he this or he that. What we heard from Lucasfilm, who were the authority, this was their stuff, their characters, and it was things like this, you know, this tertiary character looks too fat here, her bosom looks too big. Um, it, You know, it just makes me laugh at the things comics fans find to take exception to. I know they do it because they love the stuff, but sometimes um, they'll read... This is not to my taste as this is bad, or I don't like the way this looks. This isn't the way I see it in my head now that I've seen the movie. They don't say, well, he made a different artistic choice than I would have. They say he was lazy, or they say, you know, she just, just was phoning it in. It obviously wasn't what we wanted or didn't care about the source material. And it's like, no, you don't like it. That's not the same as it's not good. Because I assure you that artwork is absolutely excellent, and John and Klaus did a wonderful job, you know. But people are allowed not to like it, but guess what? Nobody knew then that this was going to be, a, you know, a monster hit. You never know going into something if you are going to have the next Twilight or the next Star Wars or the next Harry Potter. You may have something everybody thinks is going to rule the world, it's just going to become an obscure little footnote in the history of cinema. What was your relationship with uh, Lucasfilm reps like? Because I know we've uh, heard about John Byrne's take once Further Adventure started. Uh, not not good as far as Byrne was concerned. What was your what was your take on it? Oh, they were my dream date. I could not have had a better time when I dealt with the Lucasfilm people. They were absolutely wonderful. They were nice. They were fun. The people that Archie and I dealt with loved the stuff as much as we did, and it showed, and that made it a blast. And, um, you know, even on some of my later dealings with Lucasfilm on projects that, 
from a comic standpoint, might not have been as successful, they were always terrific. I think at some point along the way, probably when I was no longer dealing with them, Lucasfilm probably got some people in there who were in there because it looked like a good, secure, powerful job, and not because they insanely loved this stuff as much as George Lucas and Steven Spielberg obviously still do to this day. And they may have been difficult to deal with. You know, you'll you find that frequently everybody in at the beginning of something is just crazy about it and doing for fun and all trying to get along. And you do not get the micromanagers or the bullies until the second or third wave when they want to get on board, not because they think it's fantastic, but because it looks like a place where they could either throw their weight around or be secure in a powerful company. What were your thoughts on the further adventures of Indiana Jones once the series took off? Um, I thought it was a fantastic idea. I mean, we'd had several years of people doing really fun, interesting stuff with Star Wars, and I think I could say that safely because I don't believe at this point I was the writer on Star Wars yet, except for the odd, you know, little fill-in story here or there. And if there was ever a character who cried out for, let him do more, it was Indiana Jones. So the further adventures, what an opportunity. It was mentioned that the John Byrne was going to be heading it up, uh, a superstar at that time. What was your take on that whole situation? Because it seemed like the first few issues, and, and we're up to issue three right now that we're talking about on, on this segment, it seemed like those first few issues there was a lot going on, people coming and going. There was a, It seemed like a lot of hands, a lot of control from both sides of Marvel and Lucasfilm. What was your take? Did you get a sense? I know you weren't on the book at the time, but did you get a sense of what was going on there that that it just was a lot of people getting involved? Well, Kind of what I just said about Lucasfilm, which, by the and like I said, that was just my theory about them. I don't know. That was definitely happening at Marvel at that time. Uh, you know, what I said earlier about, you know, Marvel was not a place you went to make money. Marvel was a place where you went to make comics. Everybody was caught completely by surprise when Star Wars turned into a monster hit and just a merchandising machine and a, you know, sequel producer of the high order, and everybody was like, oh my gosh, I missed the boat on Star Wars, but I can be there for Indiana Jones. And, so, you know, it was kind of like being the little red hen. Nobody was there when we were doing that, that first movie adaptation. You know, well, this isn't going to be Star Wars. And then Raiders comes out, and it's this mammoth hit, and somebody's like, well, okay, here's where I can take control and make sure that everybody does it right. So you had a lot of people doing a lot of micromanaging, and ironically, they weren't doing it to be jerks. They weren't doing it to be cruel bullies. They were doing it out of kind of well-meaning, oblivious arrogance that, well, nobody is doing the best they can unless they're doing it my way under my supervision. So let's choke off all possible avenues for their vision or their creativity because I will help them fix it and make it better. What did you think of Gene Day? I'm talking about him in issue three now. Um, well, okay, let me just say, I think that Gene Day's unexpected, premature, tragic death, not only was that a loss for humanity because he was such a great guy, but it was an incredible, you know, and also for his family. I don't mean to make light of that at all because I knew Gene and I loved him and I wish I'd known him longer and better. But also, what an incredible loss to the, the comics industry and to art overall. He had an energy and a passion for what he did and a very original way of approaching things, and I think it was a heck of a loss when, um, you know, when, when Gene was no more. A really interesting issue that we're talking about here in Issue 3 because he did the first part of it and then Richard Howe came in and did the second part of it. Um, it looks to me like Gene Day's Harrison Ford likeness was spot on. Um, did you get a sense at the time as to what was going on? Because at some point he seemed like he was fired from Marvel. I couldn't tell if it was right from this book or if it was shortly after or what happened there. But did you kind of get a sense that he was too different almost for Marvel or too too much, too creative? You know, almost? I don't know that he ever was fired. Now, you know, obviously I, I was not involved in other people's decisions because I was working in a distinct branch. So, you know, I didn't sit in on those meetings. But I do know... There was a point 
where editorially he suddenly fell out of favor for no reason that I can determine, except I can tell you this as somebody who spent many happy and some fraught years working on the Marvel superhero line as a creator rather than a staffer herself, everybody had a point at which they were on the firing line. They were, it was just, it was like a roulette wheel and the wheel would spin. And if your number came up, it was your turn to get persecuted and be picked on and just get dumped on and get a lot, lot, lot of crap and criticism and what have you. And I do, I will say, it happens pretty much to everyone. Some people it happened to more than once, but it was never permanent. And if you just sort of sat tight, it would be somebody else's turn. And I think the, the people or person doing that kind of criticism, again, it was from this bizarre feeling that this person could do it so much better if only he would do it the way I tell him to. And, you know, that the unbearable tragedy is that Gene's death occurred. Well, it was his turn. Gene was definitely on the firing line at that time. And there are some people who even feel that this was a major contributing factor in, um, in what happened to Gene, because a nice person who does not dole out badness certainly has no reason to, to expect that he's suddenly going to have to sit there and take it when all he's done is do work that he loves the best he can. And uh, I don't know if Gene was ever formally fired or if he was getting a lot of grief or if he quit because of the grief or if it all would have blown over, which is what I like to think, because Lord knows I had to go to a cardiologist with heart palpitations at the age of 25, and I waited out my time. I didn't have a heart attack. I was fine, and it was somebody else's turn on the wheel. And I've always felt that that sh is what should have happened with Gene. You know, I hope his, his awful passing was not contributed to by his being editorially persecuted. And if it was, then other people than me have to live with that. But, you know, ordinarily you look at this and go, okay, well, it got better for him, he got better, or he went to work someplace else where he was happier, and it was all fine. I do not know if Gene was off the book or if his death ended his run on the book or something mean somebody said to him, you know, resulted in his either being fired from or quitting the book. But, you know, that was the way things were going at that time for everybody. Well, even though uh, he had a very short career, it seemed uh, he left behind an incredible legacy of work. And, and some of those panels, especially in the Indiana Jones book and some of the things he did in Master of Kung Fu, were just, just breaking the mold at that time. And it, it just oh, really really brought it to life. Um, looking back on the series, what did, what did you think of the series as a whole, the 34 issues? I know the, the book itself was sort of canceled prematurely, but what did you think of the series as a whole for other adventures? Okay, well, here you caught me a bit flat-footed. Because although David Michelini is a longtime friend of mine and I love his work, I did not read that one. And that's only because I was over my head with my own work. And also, there may have been a little bit of envy there because, frankly, I would have loved to write it. And, in fact, I wanted to be writing Indiana Jones myself so much that uh, Armin Armadillo books, you know, one of the flagship characters, the one I and not the other creators will be writing is, you know, the, the wayward son from a family of archaeologists, and he goes out and, and helps to find lost art treasures. Well, gee, I wonder what made me think that would be a good idea for a hero. Now, I've got to say, he's not named Indiana Jones. He does not wear a fedora. He does not have a bullwhip. He is set in the present time and not way back when, but... Uh, you know, yes, I loved Indiana Jones. Yes, the idea of an archaeologist hero seems to me absolutely wonderful. Is, is this your chance now with the character to sort of go back and do some of those Indiana Jones stories that you always wanted to do? I'm sure. I did not set my heart on any Indiana Jones stories specifically because, you know, it was obvious that I was not even under consideration for the for that writing assignment, especially I was way busy right then, and also, as I've already said, I pretty much had to sort of sneak, sidle, and crab walk my way into the Star Wars uh, 
writing job, which I dearly loved. And I didn't set my heart on indie. But yeah, I think subconsciously, well, here's what he should be looking for next. Definitely figures into the stuff I write now. You've been a, uh, an indie fan all along, though, too, even going back through uh, the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles and, and on. Oh, golly, yes. I love the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles. You know, to this day, if you tell me that Sean Patrick Flannery is in something, I'm going to sit down and watch it just because, hey, he was Young Indiana Jones and notice must be taken. And, you know, ditto Corey um, Carrier, but uh, the fact is, I spent the first episode or two of the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles outraged because he was so stupid. <laughs> and then it sort of sunk in. Yes, he was so stupid. He was a kid. This is not the story of our indie. This is the story of how a stupid kid became our indie. And I loved the history. I loved the adventure. I think Terry Jones from Monty Python, for example, did some of the deftest, funniest writing of his career. And I think just overall, that series had some of the most interesting and beautifully crafted writing and storytelling that um, the television medium has ever enjoyed. If you had a crack at an Indiana Jones comic now, if uh, Dark Horse or somebody called up and said, we'd like you to take a crack at it, what era of Indiana Jones would you like to pursue? Early, young Indiana Jones, Harrison Ford, Crystal Skull, older Indiana Jones, somewhere in the middle? Um, you know, I'm not sure I would want to do Crystal Skull because I was so exasperated that he let Marion slip through his fingers again for an additional 20 years and even worse, only so that they could spring that unprepossessing offspring at us. You know, it's like, okay, in the, at that point you reverted to being stupid and I'm not sure I'm completely ready to forgive you for losing Marion, getting her back, having God pretty much thrust you two together, and then you fumbled it again, you dolt. So I've got to say, pre-Raiders indie. I don't care how far pre. You know, I would do toddler indie if they would let me. You know, granted, I would not do uh, Indiana Jones babies, but if somebody <laughs> said, hey, Joe, you know, you want to do a story nobody's doing when he was 11. Hey, Joe, nobody's doing when he was 17. Hey, could you, do you want to do a sequel to The Mystery of the Blues? We'll see how how, you know, more interaction with Ernest Hemingway and Sidney Bechet will fit into the comics format, I would be there in a heartbeat. Well, what's going on now in the life of Joe Duffy? We talked about the book company a little bit. Tell, tell me a little bit about that, flesh it out, and, and what are some of the things that, that fans can expect coming up from you? I continue to write and edit for all comers. You know, I mean, obviously not all comers if they're complete jerks and what have you, but I am a freelancer, which is to say my gun, meaning my blue pencil, and uh, my word processor are for hire, but my real labor of love is the Armin Armadillo Books line, and that is actually I have I when I approached um, my authors, what I've said to them is I am looking for people who want to write stories that are like Raiders of the Lost Ark was. I look at what's happening in a lot of Hollywood, and it looks to me like there is too little action adventure and way too many flying body parts. You know, it's, it's very sad to me that they're doing sentimental reunions of Final Destination characters. It's like, okay, I guess if you are that generation, but I like to see good guys fight bad guys, get thoroughly trounced, and then come back and win. And, you know, I like to see treasure hunts. I like to see acts of daring do. And um, so I got together with a couple of friends, who feel similarly and, uh, you know, which may make us old or it may make us new and fresh, don't ask me which, and we're all writing our version of the kind of stories we dearly love to see in movies, TV, and other people's books and don't feel like we've seen nearly enough of because you can never get too much of that stuff. Anything out now the fans can get their, whole, their hands on or is this all coming soon? It's all coming soon and, you know, shame on me because... I'm the publisher, and I'm also one of the authors. And we what we will be doing probably is starting out with just an anthology, introducing everybody's characters or independent characters. And we've got some science fiction. We've got some alternate reality heroes. Those are by um, British author Jill Hale, who you know has some fan fiction online. 
and then uh, a Southern author named Shirley Dale, who was a good longtime friend of mine and has stuff online under another name, which I won't mention, plus my stuff and, uh, you know, even the odd member of the Duffy family because I come from a writing crew, although I'm the only one who's ever uh, produced fiction professionally. And how can fans get a hold of you? Fans, the best way to get a hold of me is always right now to go to my Facebook page and uh, ask to friend me. I have the luxury right now, because I'm not full up yet, of accepting all friend requests, although since there are a lot of them, I'm not always able to respond to every post. And I will say, if there is anybody out there who's ever had me refuse a friend request, believe me, it was a technical glitch. I could think of at least two occasions where I went to confirm and I never saw the page appear and, you know, the name appear. And what I should probably do is go back to the request and email, track the person down and friend them. But... If you want to friend me, friend me, and if you're mean, I'll deal with it. And if you're nice, then, hey, very nice to meet you. And when there is information about upcoming projects and the first Armin Armadillo books releases, I will be right there with announcements at Facebook and uh, online. It's Armin Armadillo Books. Uh, this is Joe Duffy. Joe, thank you so much for taking the time on the IndieCast with us today. and talking about Marvel and all things indie and our personal favorite series, uh, The Further Adventures of Indiana Jones. Joe, it has been an absolute pleasure. It's nice speaking with you, and it is always nice speaking about Lucasfilm projects and Marvel comics, and especially Indiana Jones. She's great, isn't she? Oh, my God. A lot of interesting stuff there. So passionate about the character, too. That's why I really appreciate it. It really comes through in the interview, and you just kind of wonder... Uh, what her take uh, would have been on uh, if she had been involved in the Further Adventures of Indiana Jones book. Oh, she would have brought so much to it. You know that. Just just from her enthusiasm alone for the character. I, yeah. it's, it's... And, and she made a great point, too. And, and I think uh, sometimes uh, this is really going to impact, I think, how I review uh, some of these books as well, too, that just because you don't like something doesn't mean it's bad. And I, I thought that was such a great point because some of these books were, you know, fill-in books or rush deadlines right. and things like that. Right. And just when and you she, take... she she absolutely changed my my way of looking at it now. Yeah, I mean really? that I, I've always that loved I've always loved the the Raiders of the Lost Star comic book adaptation, but it just kind of gives us a, a different perspective on the art. Um, and two, when you think about that interview and then the two others that that come up as well. Uh, there are three things that are consistent that, that you'll notice in these interviews. Uh, the first, that Marvel in the 80s at times could be a very difficult place at which to work. The second thing is that details are going to be sketchy around Gene Day's time on the book. And uh, that everybody hated Crystal Skull that we talked to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for the love of God, shut the hell up! Yeah, that seems uh, to be that, the general consensus. That's not going to go away. So, uh, yeah, you know, and, just and, a- and, and speaking of Gene Day... Um, Shooter Jim Shooter's blog also he mentions that he categorically denies firing Gene Day. It's interesting reading. Gene Day's brother also responds on the blog. Um, but what we'll do is we'll post it on the Further Adventures Facebook page, uh, and we'll send it to Ed to put on the IndieCast show notes. Uh, yeah, for you makes guys to check that out. Makes for very interesting reading. And, and again, he, you know, Shooter's saying that he did not fire Gene Day. So uh, apparently, Gene died uh, while. While he was uh, writing this book, uh, still pencil- a mystery. Or still penciling thing, the book, I should the, say. The more information we get, the the more it it seems like a, 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 just a it get, the mystery gets bigger and bigger. Yeah, exactly. And we also confirmed in that in that interview too that they did not have the Arab swordsman uh, scene from which to look. So e- even though Shooter had mentioned uh, in an earlier interview with Mitch uh, that they had seen a twenty minute rough cut of the film, apparently uh, Joe, Joe Duffy, Duffy did not. Did not. <laughs> so, uh, but. Yeah, again, great job on the book. Our next interview, uh, as we head in back into Club Obi Wan, uh, we're going to be speaking to the writer of issue three, the issue we're currently talking about. I uh, was also picked up the reins from John Byrne on on issue number two, uh, finished that script off, and also uh, wrote, boy, one of the craziest stories. Uh, as we go into issue number three of Further Adventures, we're going to be speaking to comic legend and creator. Of the the Batman villain uh, Raj Al Ghul or Raj Al Ghul, which one is it? I think it's Raz Al Ghul. Raz Al Ghul. I don't yeah. know. Let's, we'll hear from all the listeners, but uh, yeah, the co-creator <laughs> of that character. We're going to talk a little bit with Denny about his time on the Further Adventures of Indiana Jones. Obviously, a huge resume uh, in the business, and he actually talked about that resume in a podcast. 
in 2005 with Comic Geek Speak. Uh, he talked about that. So for anyone that wants the background uh, on Denny O'Neill and his life in comics, that's a great podcast interview to listen to. We're going to focus primarily in this interview on uh, Indiana Jones. Uh, so let's head back into Club Obi-Wan and talk with Denny O'Neill. Wuhan, drinks for everybody. Now, joining us now in Club Obi-Wan is editor, writer, and now educator, Denny O'Neill. Mr. O'Neill, thanks for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Oh, Club Obi-Wan, huh? It's a nice joint. It's a really good, nifty decor. We like it. We like it. We're glad you could oh, spend yeah. some time with us here today. Um, mm-hmm. Your your backstory has been uh, played out a lot of different places. I know recent, uh, a few years ago, you did an interview with Comic Geek Speak, so we talked a little bit about that. What I want to talk to you about, if people are interested in that, they can they can check that out there. But we're interested a little bit in your time with Indiana Jones. Uh, you had a chance to work on a few of the issues. We've talked about that on here on the IndieCast issues two and three in particular. Um, what was your what was your memory of working at Marvel around that time, early eighties? Indiana Jones comes into your life. Well, somebody will probably write. Uh, what it was about Marvel, working at Marvel at that time, but it ain't going to be me. <laughs> uh, it, it, it was something you're not likely to forget. Uh, but as far as Indiana Jones is concerned, uh, I love the character. Uh, he was really tough and resourceful and smart, but he had an Achilles heel. He liked girls. Uh, and he was an intellectual. He was smart. He was a college professor. That, that pushed a whole lot of my buttons. Uh, uh, I, even now, most nights, Monday through Friday, I watch the rerun of Have Gun, Will Travel on our local cowboy channel. And as a high school kid, that, that pushed a lot of the same buttons. Here was a cowboy, and he was tough, and he could shoot and beat people up. But he liked girls, and he quoted Shakespeare, and he was a connoisseur. That whole uh, conflation of intellectual with man of action is really deeply appealing, I think not only to me, but to a lot of uh, Americans. And then add to that, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark's kind of uh, implicit homage to the great old Saturday afternoon serials that some of us were lucky enough to see, and uh, even the old radio serials, which I think uh, are a largely unrecognized influence on comics. Uh, but the same kind of adventures, having you know, great adventures in, in exotic places and cliffhangers and danger, and uh, boy, you know, if you're seven years old. <laughs> That's hard to beat, and if you were, I don't know how old I was, in my 30s when I saw Raiders of the Lost Ark, it was also hard to beat then. I mean, it's just going to the movies for entertainment, that really delivered. What did you think when Marvel first got the license to Raiders of the Lost Ark, and Walt Simonson was brought on board for writing, and John B. Seam was brought on board uh, for penciling? What did you think when, when this property came in, and then you saw the movie, and you knew Marvel was going to be taking a hold of this. It wasn't on my radar. There was no reason for me me to be concerned with it. It was not my assignment. So, uh, you know, I was basically doing my job as <laughs> and trying to get through the day. I just didn't connect with Indiana Jones uh, on a uh, comic book level. There's no reason why I should have. John Byrne was brought in on issue one. He uh, did the did the scripting and also did the pencils. And you came in on issue two. What do you recall yeah. about that time? Uh, because I think it was right in the round then Byrne decided he was walking off the book. He had his issues with Marvel and with Lucasfilm reps. What was your take? What do you recall? I know this is going back a quarter century now, but what was your take at the time of, of coming in and, and basically picking up the second half of that story? Uh well, Louise Simonson, Wheezy, uh, you know, asked me if I'd be interested in in taking over the scripting. And there's no comic book writer who ever lived would refuse to work for Wheezy. Uh, and she was a, a friend besides. So, uh, and I, I, I wasn't 
my, my writing schedule was not overburdened at the time. So there was absolutely no reason for me not to do any reasonable job that came along. In this instance, uh, there was the added incentive of my really liking the base material. Yeah, you were an indie fan. Yeah, absolutely. Still am. I've, I'll even forgive him the, the icebox in the last movie. <laughs> Oh, everyone's talking about the fridge. Even even, even you. Um, when you came in on uh, to cover to pick up the story where where Byrne left off, do you, did you get a sense of of what was going on with Lucasfilm reps? H- had you had some run-ins? What what was your experience in, in trying to deal with these things? Because you you did two no. issues. Yeah, uh, I had absolutely no contact with uh, Lucasfilm reps. I did not know who they were. Never saw them, never heard their names. It is likely that Wheezy dealt with them. It is possible that not even she did, that somebody further up the food chain than an editor would have had that that job of liaising with the the movie folks. So I... uh, if there was anything to protect me from, well, Wheezy did a great job of protecting me. And that ha- happened occasionally, where somebody up the line, it happened with Mark Rulo, where somebody up the line really hated what I was doing with a character, and I had no inkling of that until years later, when a third party told me that how much grief Mark took on my behalf. Did you have an overall or a rough idea of the script uh, that Byrne had put together from issue one? This was the, the icons of Ikemanen, where the... They were dipping the the tribesmen in gold, uh, and these were became living Avengers that came to life. Did you have was the full script fleshed out, or did you only get a half script that you had to finish? I don't remember. I remember looking at art boards, and I remember reading a script. Uh, so my guess, just putting pieces of the jigsaw puzzle down, is that we had a partial. Uh, John's job was probably partially complete at that at the point that whatever happened between John and the project happened. And I probably read that, undoubtedly had some reaction to it, uh, and took it from there. And from there on, uh, having no reason not to, I kind of followed my own procedures, uh, including how the story was constructed. You know, I, I had fairly firm ideas about how a uh, fantasy melodrama story in comics should go. Uh, I would like to believe they weren't rigid, but they were good guidelines, and I probably proceeded from them. Any idea why the elders of the tribe were dipping their tribesmen in gold? We, we've still been trying to figure that out, why they were doing that in the first place. <laughs> have no idea at all. It's... <laughs> Consider that a little koan, but, you know, and a, a rule that has no answer that will uh, expand your mind. It's one of the great Indiana Jones mysteries, but uh, it's certainly a cool yeah. one. I mean, we enjoyed it. One of the one of the the most interesting things I think about the issue, the issue number two that you did, uh, the credits. When we talk about the credits at the beginning, instead of just your names, it was listed Missouri O'Neill script, Chicago Burn yeah. layouts, uh, Michigan yeah. Austin inks, Jersey. Uh, Jersey Sharon, uh, Jersey also Chang, Georgia Jones, and Pennsylvania Shooter. Was that your idea? Probably. Uh, I don't know why it wouldn't have been my idea. And we had uh, we had a lot of room to play around with things like credits. We were, uh, you know, you could have fun uh, doing that. It, it, it all uh, originated with Stan Lee, who was not only the first. Uh, comic book editor to emphasize credits at all, but to have fun with them. Uh, Rascally, I was dandy Denny. I have never forgiven Stan for that. Uh, In his uh, introduction to the book I wrote on uh, how to write comics, I think he changed it to dashing or dauntless or something like that. So I do forgive him. He has has atoned for his dandy sin. I like Missouri O'Neill better. Oh, yeah. Well, and it's truth in advertising. <laughs> now, the third uh, the third issue, that's the one we're currently reviewing right now. 
to me, it was it was one of the more bizarre indie tales about this 400 year old man and his grandson, and maybe maybe they are, maybe they found the fountain of youth, maybe they didn't. Um, it's sort of one of the more bizarre tales, but I think the backstory of how the issue came together to me was a little more interesting. We talked to Richard Howell, who was mm-hmm. a co-penciler on the issue. He mentioned that you just saw him in the hallway and said, "Hey, I need 12 pages by Friday." Is that That sounds like the way business was done back then. It was it was very informal. Yeah, because Gene Day at the time had uh, and had passed away. Um, what was your experience in working with Gene Day? Did you have much interaction with him? Had you get had you had a chance to see his pencils? How, how did that sort of no, play out? No, absolutely none. Uh, my policy has generally been: I'll do my job, and I will let the penciler do his, and I will let the inker and the colorist and the letterer do theirs. If I'm the editor, that's emphatically not true. The editor has an obligation to write hurt on every aspect of it. But a writer can, can, you know, we can usually, writers, especially if you had an office job, could look at artwork if you wanted to, but I didn't want to. Uh, I was afraid that something would upset me, and then I'd put some poor editor in a bind between my my outrage and the very realistic considerations of uh, deadlines and so on and so forth. So it was just it's less painful for me not to see this stuff and to kind of trust that if I do my job, everybody else will do theirs. What was the situation with G, Gene on the on the book? Why was he had he died at that point? Was he fired from Marvel? Do you recall what? What brought Richard All on? I remember, Joe, is that, that something happened. Again, I'm having uh, lunch with Danny Fingeroth sometime in the next two weeks. He will probably remember that stuff, and it'll be interesting to talk to him about it. Okay. But, uh, but you had, had gone to Richard at that point, and um, what, what kind of directions did you get? I remember Richard talking about a Gatling gun. He told me a story about a Gatling gun, and he told you Gatling guns weren't invented then, so I think it became a canon in the book. I guess it did. Uh, uh, as I said in our earlier conversation, I will go down to the computer when this phone conversation is ended, and I will, by God, find out when <laughs> Gatling guns were invented. I, I didn't start a feud here, did I? A, a Gatling gun feud, did I? Well, if I knew where... Uh, Richard was, I would probably offer to buy him dinner. Or <laughs> <laughs> we might we might have to, to put a, a, a dinner wager on this to figure out what, what happened here. So, uh, But, yeah, an interesting story. You mentioned Shakespeare earlier. Uh, that's what you brought into to this particular script uh, with Prospero. Oh, I wouldn't put it past me for a second, no. Yeah. Uh, comic books were, that was, that was in the period where they were becoming, in general, more sophisticated. So I might have put Shakespeare in in any case, but it was probably a good idea at the time. What was your thinking when, when you were starting issue three? What did they mention to you? I mean, did, were you given free reign? Did you have any ideas that you wanted for Indiana Jones? What, what was sort of your mindset as you approached taking this character on? Well, I mean, I had an idea of the kind of stories we should tell. Uh, the same kind that Lucas has told in every incarnation of Indiana Jones, the movies and even the TV show. I mean, you weren't going to do a Henry Jamesian uh, interior monologue, uh, and you weren't going to get overly political. It was going to be action adventure. Uh, but since he was a professor. Uh, cultural references would not only have been okay, they wouldn't be violating anything, they would be probably desirable. And if I thought about it any more than that, well, I, I'd, I'd be surprised. What would you do uh, with the character now? Uh, it would be great fun. I think I would uh, make them period pieces and would try and be inspired by the same stuff that I think inspired Lucas and Spielberg. Um, the, the kind of pulp tradition 
uh, coupled uh, with a much older tradition of the hero figure, this stuff that Joseph Campbell wrote about. Uh, I like that stuff if it's well done. If, I mean, if the, the pulp story is full of bad grammar and misspellings, it'll bother me. But if it's well written, I like the pulp tradition. And I imagine what I would try and do is, is honor it, just do those kind of stories as well as I could. I think it would be a mistake to try and make indie contemporary. I think he would work best as a period character, and that would uh, hurt the saleability of it. But, yeah, that's if some, what the comic book is. If somebody came to you now and said uh, they wanted you to take a crack at it, would you would you uh, go for it? Well, since I have absolutely nothing to do for the next two months, uh, except write a few columns, uh, yeah, I certainly would. So, what have you been up to? Oh, what have I been up to? Uh, writing some short stories. I just finished a Lone Ranger, which I think was probably going to be released in connection with the movie, and then I read in this morning's Times that the movie is canceled, but. And I did a Green Hornet, and uh, next up is a King Kong story. These are all for a Canadian publisher. Now, how did these come out? Uh, people get in touch with me and offer me jobs, and almost always I take them. I mean, there are jobs I wouldn't take, but uh, they haven't been offered to me. <laughs> So uh, I'm, I'm saved having to make that decision. And uh, I had actually two comic books come out this summer, both of which were a lot of fun to do, um, based on stories of mine from the 70s. What was that like to sort of revisit these? Well, since one of them was Wonder Woman, which I have been thinking of all these years as O'Neill's folly, uh, <laughs> it was really interesting to go back and do a story that kind of commented on the mistakes I made originally. And I contrived a plot that allowed me to get her in both the, the white jumpsuit from the, whenever it was, 70s or 80s, and something approaching her traditional costume. Uh, <laughs> so that was, was, was interesting and fun to do, uh, and also a chance maybe to atone in some small measure for previous sins. And the other was Green Lantern, Green Arrow. Uh, not the first time I have revisited those characters, uh, but it's always nice to get back to them. And that was, that was a, in, in retrospect, I don't know how much we knew at the time, but in retrospect, it was a big deal in our lives. Uh, I mean, it, it just amazes me that 30 years later, they published it in hard covers. Uh, we had no idea. We had no idea that comic books would get to the point where anybody would be interested in publishing anything in hardcovers. Uh, I, well, worked... I have to ask, did you see the Green Lantern movie, since we're talking about Green Lantern a little bit? Yes, I did. Thoughts? I have, I, I am married, I, one of the things I will go to hell for is 22 years ago, I took a perfectly normal suburban St. Louis school teacher, married her, and turned her into a raving fangirl, so... Uh, <laughs> Well, congratulations on that. <laughs> uh, and, yeah, with, with her uh, towing me, we, we saw the Green Lantern movie. Did you like it? It hasn't. It ain't the story I would have written, but it didn't have to be. I thought they were very smart in going back to the uh, original stuff that Julie Schwartz and John Broom and Gil Kane did in 1959 or 1960. Uh, it is a very serviceable science fiction premise. They worked a miracle with the, um, with the Guardians because that was a problem when I was writing the book. Like, these are supposed to be the most ancient, wise, awesome beings in the galaxy, and they look like Smurfs in, in red nightgowns. Uh, the art director of the movie somehow, without violating that basic design, gave them a gravitas and a solemnity uh, that really made those scenes work, I thought. You know, you go into a movie as you're a guy like me, and if it's that kind of movie, your professional head kicks in. The big exception was the last two Superman movies, particularly uh, Batman movies. 
the one that I worked on that, that used one of my characters. I also did the novelization and reading the movie script. I was just, yeah, boy, they really got this right. Mm. You know, why didn't I think of some of these bits? This is really uh, right on. And I think the movie lived up to my expectations. But generally, you know, you go in not expecting to completely enjoy it because it's a little too close to what you do for a living. Do you think Wonder Woman will ever take off? Do you ever think they'll get a, a correct version of that, or is that just almost impossible to film? Well, they don't really seem to have a handle on it, do they? I was really looking forward to the TV show because of the um, the writer-producer, uh, David E. Kelly, I think is one of the best writers around, and now that... Um, Aaron Sarkin has quit writing for TV. Kelly is probably the best television writer in the country. And he's never gone anywhere near anything that was fantasy melodrama before. So it would have been interesting to see what his sensibility would do to that kind of material. It looks like we'll never know. Well, the aborted pilot is on YouTube, so you can watch what is it could it have really? been. really? It's out there. Um, oh, that's really good information. I will, <laughs> I will look at it. Now, yeah. now that you're all over the Internet and on Facebook and everything else, you can, uh, yeah. you can sit there now and watch I'm Wonder like Woman. solidly in the 21st century. <laughs> you can sit there and watch failed pilots <laughs> like the rest of us can. I can just sit and stare and... Till the sun rises over the river. And, and waste time like, like uh, the rest of us do. Um, and you're an educator now. We, we talked about that. Uh, working for NYU? Uh, yeah. Danny Fingroth had been had started the NYU class and was going to take a year off to write his book on um, Jews and comics and ask if I would guest lecture for him. So... So you've got that coming uh, up in the fall? Well, I've been doing it for five years now. After, after Danny wrote his book, and we got together, and he said, well, uh, you know, at this point it's as much your class as mine, so if you want to keep doing it, keep doing it. And are these uh, open to anybody? I mean, can they, people can yeah, use this? Yeah, uh, the way it works, it seems that when I do an advertisement, we get a lot of enrollees. When I don't do an advertisement, we don't. So if I send out a press release, I'll probably have a decent-sized class. So every uh, year, I, about this time, I make a decision. Well, how, do I really, am I up for doing this in the fall? I'm already committed to doing it in the spring. It startles me that, that I am respectable. <laughs> that Danny and I have, have uh, and Mike Uslan and... Tom DeFalco have spoken at the Library of Congress and at the 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 Smithsonian Institution. I mean, that's that's really the stamp of approval from the establishment. And you know, to go into the gift shop at those places and see you know stuff I've worked on. Well, it looks like you've got um, possibly some dates coming up in the fall. Then, are you going to post those on your Facebook page uh, whenever you have more information on those? Can I do that? Yeah, I guess I can. Sure. That's what you use Facebook page as far, isn't it? That's what you do. Yeah, I will do that if if I will probably decide that I want to teach this coming semester, and unless a book assignment or something comes up. Well, and I, uh, it's good that you have that up there. I mean, fans like us like seeing updates, like seeing what you're up to, and it's nice to wave yeah, the venue you can go and do that. I will, I will certainly do that. I will have have my son. Tell me how to put something up on Facebook. Duh. And, uh, uh, yeah, we appreciate will, your son's will... efforts. <laughs> so, so do I. I. This is why you have children. I didn't know when I did it 40-something years ago, but now it's, it's all clear. You, you have sturdy young men who help you move and who understand technology. Yeah. Well, we appreciate, the, uh, we appreciate those updates. We'll look forward to those dates and also those, uh, those stories you got coming up, the books that, that you mentioned. So hopefully we can uh, post those whenever those are going to be available. And uh, I just want to take the time to thank you for, for joining us on the IndieCast today and for, for crafting one of the, the more interesting Indiana Jones tales. Uh, from quite some time ago, and uh, and for making uh, it memorable for us who love that series. 
Well, you're quite welcome. Well, Mr. O'Neill, thank you again for joining us and, and for taking the time here on the IndyCast. Uh, it, it's really been fun for me to revisit uh, that stuff that was really a lot more good than bad about it. Um, so, yeah, thank you for giving me that opportunity. Well, there you have it, our interview with comic legend Denny O'Neill. He's got such a such a history a, with comic yeah. books. It's, it's amazing just to talk what to him. What a resume this guy has. I mean, and, and you can – when we do our review of issue number three, you'll definitely see, like we mentioned before, Raz Agul and, and Prospero. There are a lot of similarities uh, in, in, in Denny O'Neill's contribution to the Indiana Jones world. Yeah, these um, things always sort of come back in. And, yeah. you know, I appreciate – again – we we got a little bit of the the issues fleshed out. You know, obviously he's picking up where where one left off with his issue two. Three was a fill in issue, uh, so it, it's understandable if if some of the details get lost to time. I'm sure if somebody asked me about something I wrote 25 years ago in high school, I, I would have no idea. So just yeah, the fact of course. that uh, we're it's, able to get as much as we could, I, we're very appreciative of that. Yeah, we're very thankful, and thanks again to Danny O'Neill for for that. Great interview. But, yeah, and it was you know. it was interesting too. Speaking to Richard Howell, I uh, talked about the Gatling gun again. We I've, we've done some research since this. The, uh, the Gatling gun <laughs> was invented in the 1860s, so yeah. I'm wondering if he must maybe, have been. Yeah, he, he, Howell must have been referring to something else. He I could have been referring to something else. So if nothing else, yeah. we 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 have started the the great Facebook debate of 2011 over Gatling guns <laughs> because they both commented uh, to us on the Facebook pages about this. So uh, you know, if nothing else, we've taken some obscure little panel from 25 odd years ago. And, uh, and and made it interesting. So, all right. So, uh, Keith, ready for one more interview? I'm ready. How about a twofer? I think we got uh, some room in Club Obi One. Uh, you know, we talked about this. I called uh, Louise Simonson uh, for this last issue, and her husband Walt just happened to be in the room. Asked him if he could jump on uh, the other phone as well. So we ended up getting a twofer for this. So uh, four interviews for our IndieCast listeners. So hopefully, we're not uh, getting too overwhelmed with information at this point. But let's head back into the club one more time for our interview with the Simonsons. Well, it looks like we have room uh, for one more table here is open at Club Obi-Wan, so who better to invite in to Club Obi-Wan than the Simonsons? Uh, Walt Simonson and his wife Louise Simonson, welcome both to the IndieCast and Club Obi-Wan. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Uh, for As we've talked about, uh, Walt, you uh, kick-started everything with the, the Indiana Jones world in comic books with your adaptation of Raiders of the Lost Ark. And Louise, uh, as we know, probably more familiar as Louise Jones uh, from your time on the book uh, we had for editing the first 13 issues of Further Adventures. So we're glad to have you both here and talk all things indie. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Louise, why don't we start with you? What, what was your earliest memory of just even getting started in, in interesting comic books? Oh, an interesting comic books. Gosh, I read them when I was little. Um, I, I, didn't, I read Lone Ranger and um, Superman. Uh, particularly the duck books, those I loved. Um, you know, Little Lulu when I could find them. Um, one or two of the uh, the horror books from um, from from EC. I read I or the I read I read in a little bit of the, the science fiction books, but those were rare when I was a child, and you couldn't really find them. Every what? once in a while, somebody's brother had collected one, and you could find one. That's interesting because one of your first jobs uh, wasn't modeling for one of the uh, one of the dark was it House of Secrets. Well, it wasn't a job. It was I did the cover. I I was a, I guess the model sort of for the cover for House of Secrets, maybe the Bernie Wrights and Dan. I was a friend of Bernie's, and he just wanted somebody to sit there with a hairbrush in their hair, and I did that. <laughs> so that's how I, that's how I got to do that job. Sort of so became iconic, though, didn't it? Well, I, they're going to put that on my gravestone. They're going to say, "Yep, she modeled for House of Secrets, and yeah, she wrote a few things too." <laughs> <laughs> When did you first uh, realize, well, how young were you when you first realized that I really would like to do this for a living? I'd like to get into the world of comic books. I'm going to give it a shot. Oh, gosh, I don't know. I, mean, I was in my 20s, I think. I didn't think of doing it seriously. I knew I wanted to be in publishing somewhere, but I didn't think of doing comic books until, although I had a lot of friends who did comics, until one of my friends told me about an opening at Warren Publishing that paid better than the job I was doing in advertising promotion for a magazine publisher. So I applied for it, and I got it. I was, uh, was the, um, oh, a production person at Warren, the Warren Books, and I really liked doing the editorial stuff better and was better at it. So they moved me over to editorial in, I don't know, a couple of months after I got there. 
What were the challenges of trying to break into the industry in the 70s, uh, just from a, a female perspective? Was, was it tough for you to do that? No, it never occurred to me that there were any challenges. In fact, I applied for this job. I got it. I got moved over. And then when, uh, when Bill DeBay was the editor and when he left, Warren was looking around for someone to take over the line. And I went in and told him, I would like to be the editor. And he said, girls can't do horror comics or can't edit horror comics is what he said. And that was the first time it occurred to me that there was any kind of challenge involved in it at all. So I said, look, I'll edit the books for six months for my assistant's salary with no assistant, and I'll get everything on schedule. And uh, he said, sure, because <laughs> he's not stupid. He's <laughs> saving himself a bundle of money, and he knew I could do the job. So um, so he he put me on the books, and he said, sure, go ahead. And I so I edited them, and... Uh, did what I said, and the books sold better than they had before. And uh, eventually, I was like, I was after the six months, I was the editor of the line, and then eventually, he even made me a vice president. Oh boy! So, <laughs> so that's that's um that was my time at Warren. It wasn't. It just you know, and he he honestly didn't believe that girls couldn't edit horror comics. He just said that because he liked pushing buttons, and I think he wanted me to like get mad at him or something. So it worked. I mean, that oh, did, yeah. did you find, did that sort of throw you off and then inspire you to even work harder and, and prove uh, yourself? No, I would have worked as hard anyway, and he knew it. He was just, he was just pushing buttons because he liked to see people get all red in the face, and I didn't. I just said, look, this is, this is what, what would happen. And he said, okay. And actually it worked out great for Warren because he got six months of the books edited for the price of an assistant editor's salary. <laughs> So he saved and he didn't have to pay an, another assist, an editor's salary at all. That's right. You know, it was like, wow. So he saved a lot of money, got the books <laughs> on time, and then gave Weezy the title and the job at the end of that time. I'm sure he didn't have any complaints about that at all then. No, he didn't. Uh, how, did, how did you both end up working for Marvel Comics? Well, uh, I got hired over to Marvel uh, by Jim Shooter. He, you know, I guess, you know, we'd gotten to know each other by <laughs> when we played volleyball over in the park. And he eventually asked me if I would come over and edit for uh, for Marvel. Um, you know, I, I hadn't had any intention of moving over there until he asked me. It never occurred to me, but you know, it seemed like a good idea. It was a bigger pond, so you know, I so I, I at that point I was ready to move, and I did. Um, and Walter Walter's that story is actually much more interesting. Well, I mean, the simple end of it is that I I came to New York in the early seventies looking for work in comics. I I went to D.C. first because at that time they were putting out what I thought were the more interesting comics. Uh, they had the, oh, the Shadow and Swamp thing and the Edgar Rice Burroughs stuff. They'd done a lot of kind of offbeat things, much of which didn't last real long but was still really cool to read. So, and, you know, Bernie Wrightson and Chaikin and Michael Kaluta, Dan Green, a bunch of new guys were working there at the time or, or just coming in. So... Uh, it was very exciting. It was a very exciting place to get into comics. I, I kind of lucked out and and got some early jobs. So I was at DC for about four years, and then at the end of the four years, uh, I was offered uh, some work at Marvel. Um, I was offered actually, I think probably the Rampaging Hulk, a black and white Hulk magazine that ran for a bit. Doug Mensch wrote it. Uh, I moved over and began doing that. That was I was doing layouts at the time, but basically I and then you know comics, especially back then, was such a small business. It was all in New York. You knew everybody. You know, if you were in the business for very long, you knew everybody. So Marv and Wolfman and Len Wein, guys like that, were at Marvel. Uh, and a lot of guys jumped back and forth, Jerry Conway, Steve Gerber. So I got to know a lot of those guys after the Rampaging Hulk was my time when that was over after about about a year. Um, Len Wein was writing Thor. John Buscema was getting off. I asked if I'd be interested in getting on the book as a layout artist. I got on that. He went well. We got on that. We had a lot of fun for a year. And then basically I just, you know, kind of segued into doing a lot of other Marvel stuff over time. Uh, a couple of years later, I guess in 79, I was doing, I was drawing Battlestar Galactica based on the TV show. Wheezy was the editor, at least later in the run. I'm not sure the whole thing. I don't remember who was editing the whole thing. But I did some of the issues, and eventually uh, the book ran a couple of years. Toward the end of that time, the writer of the book, Roger McKenzie, got off the book, and Wheezy asked if I wanted to take a crack at writing it. Uh, I had helped with a lot of plotting up to that point, sometimes more, sometimes less. But I thought, sure, I'd give it a shot. And the, the book wasn't doing all that well, so basically it was a great place to learn because 
if the book went down the tubes, nobody would blame me for having that happen. If the book did well, I'd be okay. As it happened, it went down the tubes. But in the last five issues, I wrote four of them, which was my first writing in comics. And the reason that's significant in this particular temple is because Archie Goodwin, who was an editor at Marvel at the time, and I'd worked with over at DC on Manhunter some years earlier, I knew Archie, he was a good friend, knew him really well, and he liked the four issues of Galactica that I had written. He was very complimentary. He caught me in the hallway one day and asked me if I'd be interested in writing an adaptation of a movie. And uh, he was supposed to do it, but he was overcommitted, as Archie often was, and said, I really like those issues. Do you want to take a crack at writing the adaptation of you know, some film called Raiders of the Lost Ark? I said, yeah, yeah, you know, hey, what the heck? I'm not doing anything this week. Sure, I'll, I'll take a crack at that. We also said, I think John Buscema was penciling and Klaus was inking. I'm, I'm a giant John Buscema fan, one of the finest drafts in Storytellers comics ever had. And it was a, a treat. And, of course, doing adaptation meant that I had the screenplay. Didn't have to do a lot of work writing stuff. You could really kind of go with the words that were there. So it was really a pretty easy job from that angle. And uh, John was a wonderful storyteller. So he, we work in Marvel style. He drew the art from the screenplay, and then I wrote the dialogue from the screenplay to match his art. And we did three issues, and it worked out pretty well. Yeah, I think at the time it, it's it was so difficult. We look back now and, and think, you know, oh, okay, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones. But at the time, nobody had any clue as to what what this was going to turn into. Is that was that your take on it? Oh, sure. I mean, you know, a lot of that stuff, you just you do it when it comes along. I mean, as it happened, I wrote the first issues of Indiana Jones, and I, I, well, Raiders, and then I also I drew the original Alien graphic novel at a time when Alien was just, you know, kind of one more monster movie that was coming out. So who knew it would become a franchise? And, you know, at the time, stuff like, stuff like that happens. You never really know. I mean, certainly some work is created, especially these days, to try to become franchises, and, well, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. So mostly what you try to do is your best work at that time and place, and then after that, you're not working for legacy. You're kind of working to make the paycheck right then, and if it turns out to be successful and other people are able to do stuff with it, that's great. Do but it was, you know, it was, I mean, it was fun. The story was fun. I don't think at the time we had a bunch of stills from the movie, uh, black and white, uh, 8 by 10 glossies. Uh, it was kind of funny because they had taken somebody, I don't know who, probably at, at – uh, I don't know if it would be a Lucasfilm or whoever would supply the glossies. They had very carefully uh, run some kind of a router across the photographs vertically and horizontally to make a thin white line cut right through the emulsion in the photograph. Uh, and usually they would cross somewhere in the middle of, of uh, somebody's face, like Harrison Ford's face. I guess the idea being we couldn't take these and sell them to Time, Time Magazine in advance to, to spoil the fun of the movie. It was, it was very funny, really. It made using it as reference for the faces a little harder, but... I wasn't drawing it, so it wasn't really my problem. But we had that kind of, you know, we had a script. I think I only had one version, I think, of that script. Um, it included stuff like, for example, the comic. There's a scene with a submarine, which I don't think is in the final cut of the movie. So there are some things in the comic that were in the screenplay that turned out not to be in the film later on. Yeah, we've talked about that before in the IndieCast, where it's almost like a director's cut uh, that we get, because those are the only places that we can find those scenes. There's the the scene in the Raven Bar where where Marion and Indy kiss. That's that was cut mm -hmm. out of the movie. Uh, does it? How much of that did you know ahead? Of, did you know those scenes uh, were? Oh were no! I mean, we I mean, we had this, in the film. We were not shown any advanced cuts. We just you know we had the screenplay and we that's what we drew or wrote and drew and then it, you know after that it was you know everything else in somebody else's hands talking about the pencils i mean we've we've talked about this we've gotten some feedback here on the indie cast what are your thoughts when you look at the pencils uh, on that book are you happy are you most of my thought about well two things on that one of them is i think my interest in comics i mean a lot of comics is the storytelling and there really are very few guys who are better storytellers than john the way john draws panel to panel continuity is really beautiful, whatever's going on with the actual with the drawing. Also, my guess is that John was doing layouts for Klaus to ink. Those are more difficult to do. There may have been deadline stuff. I'm, I'm sure there were deadline things. I, um, I don't remember much more about that. I, I mean, I, we didn't, you know, we had still photographs. Nobody had any reference. I'm assuming from the way John drew it that we probably had likeness rights. I'm not certain about that. Uh, li rights to use likenesses are negotiated along with everything else. Um, so, for example, I drew 
the adaptation of Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and in that comic, before that comic, Marvel did not have the likeness rights. So I'm um, now looking at what John drew, very simply, what I remember about it. We probably had him for that book, I'm not sure. But as far as seeing a lot of the work, I mean, a lot of the, I mean, you know, things like sets and like the kind of thing like that, it would have been whatever stills we had available. There were a bunch of black and white stills, but it, again, it's not like seeing the movie, and you are very dependent on kind of interpolating stuff from a limited amount of data in order to create, you know, a comic that makes sense as a comic. I mean, mostly, my own interest often in stuff like that is not so much that I want to make an exact replication of the film, because, you know, if you want that, go see the film. But I'd like to make a good comic book. Um, and I fought on balance for, you know, what comics were about in 1980, and it came out pretty well. Now, Louise, you uh, already had an association with uh, Lucasfilm. With uh, you were working on the Star Wars book at the time, uh, and how did you? How were you introduced to the world of Indiana Jones? How did that come about? Uh, I think I saw the movie. That was my first introduction. I don't remember seeing the screenplay, although I'm, I'm, it, you know, it was in the house. But I know that you know I had my work. Walter had his work and. We probably had the screenplay sitting around the house and I'm I was sure, in the because sure I'd be working on I'm it. I'm sure we did. I don't think I actually read it because there was no reason to. Yeah, you, you, you had plenty to do. I had my own stuff to be off. saying. Um, <laughs> right. I'd known, not knowing that I would be given the book to um, to edit. How did that I, come about then when you were when you were introduced to the further adventures of Indiana Jones? Who approached you to edit the book? <laughs> Who remembers? Probably Shooter. <laughs> I'm sure it was Jim. Because... I mean, that's, he was the guy in charge of assigning material to edit to people, so I'm sure. And I was editing a lot of licensed stuff. Hmm. That, that tended to be you know, I, the licensed stuff and the mutants is what I had. Was there a difference for you in tackling licensed material as opposed to uh, you know, the, 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 the characters that they had, whether it was you know, Spider-Man, Hulk, or anything like that, when you're dealing with straight comic book characters as opposed to licensed products? Well, there was another layer of bureaucracy and that, you know, the, there, there, were, there were things that you could do and things you couldn't do. Everything had to be run past the people who approved the stuff at the different companies. But other than that, no, we just tried to, you know, tell good stories. With and more time was involved. Back then, right. you didn't have faxes, you didn't have uh, the Internet. So stuff had to go back and forth, I guess mostly by mail, I think. Now, Walt, yeah. when uh, Louise was offered uh, the book, since you, a couple years after uh, you had started working on Raiders, uh, and then, obviously, there's an Indiana Jones juggernaut at this point because, you know, once the movie hit, you know, everybody knew about it. Did you offer any Indiana Jones advice, having already been in that world yourself? Oh, no, not at all. <laughs> she, she, she was a grown-up. She'd seen the movie. She'd read the comics. She knew what she was doing. So it never crossed my mind. I mean, it, you know, it was the, the, the advice. I mean, which, were you, were you, what you sprang from was the, the movie. Now, Louise, as editor, what was your job on the Further Adventures of Indiana Jones? What did you have to do? Uh, my job would have been to hire people to oversee the scripts and art production and to get it out on time. Oh, you know, actually, going back to the Lucasfilm people, I, you know, I remember more on Star Wars, because our interaction with them was longer. Yes. And, do you, Walter, do you remember, it, you could tell what the next movie was going to be about by what we weren't allowed to do? Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty funny, actually. There was, at well, some point, we wanted to do, bring, do a, I mean, the, the obvious idea to, that with the Death Star was that, you know, so you build another Death Star and you put some chicken wire over the port so it can't be used to blow the thing up. That was David Michelini. Yes. We, he got on the book as the writer by the time I got on as the artist. And that was David's first idea. Let's, they're going to they're gonna build a new Death Star, and they're not going to put these open exhaust ports. And uh, that was the idea that got submitted. Came back from Lucasfilm and said, this was, we were doing the book right after the second film. Uh, Han was in Carbonite. And... Right, so we couldn't use Han. There were things we couldn't do. We couldn't use Han. Couldn't have Luke and Leia. Have a romance. They couldn't tell us why, but Luke and Leia couldn't have a romance. You couldn't have they couldn't, couldn't show Vader and Luke in the same panel. Right, Vader and Luke couldn't be in the same. Couldn't actually be face to face. So it was. A, I mean, it's an odd period because one of your heroes you can't use, your hero and your heroine you can't have a romance with, and you can't show the hero you can use with the main bad guy. So I mean, I don't think any of that's obvious in the comic. I think if you read the stories that David did, 
I thought he finessed all he that stuff. He did a great job. David was really, really good at that. He, stuff. he finessed that just brilliantly. And he, but the first, his first idea was a you know, new Death Star. And the word came back from Lucasfilm. Oh, I'm sorry, you can't do a new Death Star. We can't tell you why. <laughs> so we said, okay, so movie three is about a giant. He's going to have a Death Star, of course. Was. But but then we went back and we said, okay, how about if we do a giant cannon floating in space <laughs> that can blow up planets? But it won't be round. And they said, all right, fine. <laughs> so in the first, the first couple of issues we did to take the Tark, and we, did it, we invented a giant cannon floating in space. It even had the same concave disc on the front that the Death Star did that was the cannon. Uh, it was called the General Tarkin, which was a great name for it in the wake of Tarkin's death in the first film. And, uh, but we just drew it as a, you know, I drew it as kind of a giant bunch of geometry floating in space with very small star destroyers floating around it so you get some sense of the scale. And so we were able to do the story just the way David had wanted to do it. We just didn't make, you know, around Death Star. I think we were, weren't we also forbidden from doing little fuzzy critters that hang glided or something like <laughs> there was that? There something like that. I think Joe Duffy remembers doing that. In any case, there was apparently some effort to do, and I, I don't know where this would even have come from, to do little fuzzy hang gliding creatures. And they said, no, you can't do that. And we all kind of went, we can't what? <laughs> I, I beg your pardon? And I think flying motorcycles, we weren't supposed to do those either. Oh, that's right. I think we had flying motorcycles, we couldn't do that. So every so often you you would come up with an idea, you know, it seemed like a, something you could do, and then they'd say, no, I can't do that, we're not telling you why. And it was, yes, and it, it was always something that was so specific that you said, oh, okay, that's in the next movie. Right. Oh, I right. so wish you could have done the Ewoks in the comics so they could have been left out of the movies, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, well there you go. History. speaking of David, uh, you brought him in with issue four of the Further Adventures of Indiana Jones. Uh, so obviously you had what's that? That was very smart of me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. Well, let's let's talk about that because that you obviously had a relationship with him at that point. Why was he the guy that should take over Indiana Jones? And and how did you feel about his stories? Oh, his stories were wonderful. Um, he he turned things in. They were perfect. Lucasfilm liked him. And uh, I had no complaints with David at all. He, he, he was very careful and thorough in his stories. You know, every, when he put a period there, he expected the period to be there. When he put a comma there, he expected the comma to be there. Um, he was very precise. He was very precise, and he remembered so that if something... I mean, I, I usually wouldn't change anything in his stuff I, without contacting about it. I'm looking at the letters column from issue number eight of Further Adventures of Raiders of the Lost Ark, the readers of The Lost Ark, uh, Louise Jones, editor, Danny Fingeroth, assistant editor, and there was a theme to all the letters in that letters column about bringing Marion Ravenwood back into the series. Why did it take so long for Marion to come in? I think she came back in in issue six. I don't remember. I have no memory of that at all. I, I, well, I wonder about that. Six isn't so long. If she's not an issue one, and everybody starts screaming, "Bring Marion Ravenwood back!" Back in those days, by the time you're doing issue, by the time issue one is out, you're probably working on issue three or four. You could be working on issue five. So if a decision is made to bring her back, you would it, would, it might take a month or two to work the stories. Or if you're in the middle of some story, I mean, I don't know what the story is. Right, I have no idea. But if you're in the middle of some story arc or something like that, I need a couple of issues. So taking five issues or you know, almost a half a year to bring something about. Everybody's screaming for it at some point. That's just not very unusual. You're just building the anticipation for the fans, right? Yeah, I'm sure it was It was all completely premeditated. <laughs> so, but she, if she wasn't in John's for a couple of issues and, and people wanted her back, and then you had to have a fill-in. Had a fill-in, right. find, you know, regular guys. Then you're already up to issue four without having where You're just getting your regular team put back together again. So I think bringing her back by issue six, it may seem a long time in the real world, but... As far as the amount of lead time in print media, not that long. Now, you left the book after 13 issues. Uh, was there a reason for that, or did you just get something else? Um, I think, El I think Elliot Brown came in and took over. Um, El Elliot was my assistant at that time. And usually we handed our assistants, you know, a books or two to, to edit, them on, edit on their own so they could get practice doing that sort of thing. Um, and... I, I I think there there was a lot of mutant stuff heating up at that point. I think we we we'd come up with a, maybe new mutants, and there were there were graphic novels being produced for you know X Men graphic novels, and um, 
So I think probably, and honestly, Indiana Jones was so easy with David writing it. He was so good that, um, you know, it was, a, it was a really good book to give to an assistant. So the trains kind of ran on time by themselves. The trains ran on time by themselves. Yeah, David was terrific. Dark Horse has reprinted the books recently in, in omnibus form. What do you think about the fact that there's a whole new generation of, of uh, people picking these books up again and enjoying them? Well, that's always nice. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's nice for, it, it's really great for everybody. It's great for the readers because they get some really, really good stories because all of David's stories are great. Um, and you, and it's, it's, you know, it's nice for the readers too who really li- love the character. It's good for them to be able to, to think, see other things that Indy did that, you know, didn't make it to the big screen. <laughs> are you both Indiana Jones fans? Yeah. yeah. Well, the first, we like, well, it depends on the movie. I'm a, I'm a really, I'm a huge fan of the first film. Me too. I've enjoyed the other films, but I, the first film was the one where, you know, it was all new and fresh and interesting, and as well as pulpy and old-fashioned all at the same time, and Harrison Ford was great, so yeah, what's I, not to like? I thought the second movie was lame, sorry, but I think so. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm not with you on that. Um, but the, but the, the uh, Last Crusade one was terrific. Yeah, I, I thought that was a lot of fun. Did you get to see Crystal Skull? Oh, God. Bleh. Yes, I saw it. I didn't love it. <laughs> <laughs> now, be, now be nice. You've got a lot of Indiana Jones fans listening. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know. Maybe people like it. I thought it was ridiculous. It was time after time I was pulled out of the movie by something that was just so ridiculous. It didn't it didn't make sense for me. So I that I I, I thought I did the movie the book a disservice, and I was sorry that I, I thought Marion was completely not well used at all if you had a chance to tackle indiana jones today what time period would you set him in what, what's your favorite how, how would how would louise simonson tackle an indiana jones project today okay um you know i i actually think that uh, the nazi stuff was great but i love old indy who's, who's kind of creaking along you know doing the best he can um using his brain and his muscle and his you know what muscles are left to him bless his heart and, um, you know, still being the best he is at what he does, even though he's getting older. I think I really liked that part of Indiana Jones. I loved the last movie. I just thought it was great. But I thought they lost the thread of the character somewhere in there. I don't know if they were trying to be cool for the kids, so it was like too much Shania, whatever his name is, Shana Buff? Shia LaBeouf. Shia LaBeouf, mm-hmm. whatever his name is. Um, it. it I don't know. But I, I think that's the character I would focus on. Um, I, I actually love the idea of doing, you know, 50s stuff. You know, communists and all that. I thought that was actually, I thought that part of it was fun. Walt, how about you? What take would you like to... Uh... You know, well, a couple of things really quick. One is, I probably wouldn't do it under the, in, in the modern world simply because the circumstances of doing licensed properties are very different than they were 30 years ago. Um, one of the things that happens, for example, now is mostly you have likeness approvals. What that means is the artist spends a great deal of time making sure that actor Y and actor Z approve their likenesses, which means a lot of your creative energy goes into doing stuff that has nothing to do with the story. My interest is in the story. If, if someone said, here's the property, do what you want, I mean, I'm very good. I've done work for higher stuff most of my career. I'm very good at not breaking the stuff I work on. I love doing it. Um, but I would, if I did, I like, I like Weezy's idea. I mean, I, I also, I loved, I mean, Nazis have done a lot. They did it very well in Indiana Jones, but they have been done a lot. But I love the idea of doing Indy in the 50s. In the movie, in the last movie, they kind of crammed most of the 50s decade into a single year. I know. That was okay, but I would probably have preferred, you know, a longer run through the 50s. And I know that's a great time. I like, you know, look, I'm older myself. Maybe it's because I like, maybe I like an older hero at this point. I'm not sure. But I thought, I thought that would give, that milieu would give India a chance to do some stuff and behave in ways and kind of meet problems, solve problems, in ways maybe he wouldn't have earlier, or that he would have when he was younger. And I thought that was pretty cool. So as a period, if he just said, here's the property, go to town, um, that's probably where I would set it. I don't know what kind of stories I would do. I mean, the thing is, the 50s, it's so full of Cold War stuff, leftover Nazis in South America, uh, UFOs, all that kind of, you know, Roswell, all that stuff. It's all floating around there in the 50s. 
you would have a huge theater to play in. But, but I'm kind of at the point also in real life where I'm not so interested. I mean, I've, I haven't done a lot of licensed stuff in some time. That's probably deliberate because there are, there are, if anything, there are more hurdles to jump over now with licensed properties than there were 30 years ago. And it's mostly hurdles from people who really you know, don't know comics for the most part. And I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm getting too old for that stuff. I'm like Indiana Jones. I'm too old for this crap. It'd be fun to do Indiana Jones untrammeled in the 50s. Who knows, maybe we'll see a Simonson and Simonson take on the uh, Indiana Jones character at some point. Well, one never knows. <laughs> <laughs> Not after my review of Crystal Skull. <laughs> 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 yeah, we won't. We won't tell George Lucas about that. Now, Louise, I'd, I ha- I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about uh, your time on uh, Superman as well, with the death of Superman. Um, you created Steel. Yes. Um, I created Steel. Thoughts on Shaquille O'Neal? Oh well, I think it was very, very cool that Shaquille O'Neal wanted to play Steel in the movie. Um, I he's, Shaquille is a huge Superman fan. And it, I think he loved it that we, that, that there was a black Superman. He was Superman's soul. And I think it was really, really cool that he, as a grown up, wanted to pretend to be Steel. I mean, that's pretty awesome, isn't it? <laughs> so the movie wouldn't have gotten made, I think, had he not wanted to do it. I think he was a. He was the impetus for it. So that thing that's very I think it was very cool that he that, that you know, Shaq wanted to do such a thing. Just want to say thank you both uh, for taking some time with us today here on the IndieCast and thank you for uh, what an amazing run we've had in the comic book world with Indiana Jones and we thank you both. Oh, you're welcome. We're, we we appreciate your efforts bringing it to a future generation. It's been our pleasure and uh, I hope all the readers enjoy all the adventures. And there you have it, further fans. Walt Simonson and Louise Simonson, unbelievable, unbelievable stuff. Yeah, I was glad we were able to get uh, both of them together. Good, and, good and stuff. Apparently, Great stuff. it's it's uh, Walt Simonson and the staff at Marvel that sounds to me like they officially wrote Return of the Jedi. <laughs> Pretty close. Yeah, I just I, like I said in the interview, I wish they had uh, done the done the Ewoks and stuff, putting them in the movie. But and and thanks a lot to you. Now I had to go and buy all of the uh, Star Wars omnibuses for the for the Marvel comics. Thank a little you very much for that. <laughs> yes, I'm glad I could uh, bend your credit card a little bit more. But ah, oh, God, it's good, killing me. Good. I mean, I'm I'm inspired now too to sort of dig back through and and read some of these older issues. We talked about Michael Golden's uh, issue that that he had, and now realizing all these people that, that are working on further adventures, a lot of them worked on the Star Wars book. So kind of digging through those and, and finding those. And, and you, you've purchased the omnibuses. What are they up to? Volume 4, Volume 5? Volume now? 4 they, they just released in August. And I think Volume 5 is going to be released. And that's going to complete the Marvel series. Um, and that's going to be released sometime in 2012, I believe. But, you know, i got to say, I've always been a Marvel guy. I've always been a big fan of Marvel. And I was, I mean, even as a kid... Uh, you just for me, you saw the difference between Marvel and DC, and I was really happy that Marvel picked up these these properties, uh, Star Wars and Indiana Jones. I mean, I couldn't be happier. Yeah, and, apparently, and especially as an adult now too. I'm, you know, apparently not um, a great place to work in the '80s, but for us yeah, fans and for, for us readers, as a kid, oh. as a kid I love them. I these, love those uh, you books. know, these are uh, that was a great era. Uh, we're looking Absolutely. through some of these licensed properties. And a big thanks to everybody that joined us on the show today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Joe Duffy, Danny O'Neill, Walton Louise Simonson. Great job. Great job, it all. It was great having you guys in Club Obi-Wan. Hope to see you guys there again real soon. Oh, okay, that's it for the day, then. Well, that's all the time we have for today. I think we took up uh, a little bit extra time on today's show. Yeah, so thanks, yeah. Ed, for giving us a little bit of extra air time here. A little extra credit. And next time coming up, we we promise we are going to get to our review of the crazy, wild, wacky issue number three. Yeah, and unlike Prospero, uh, who is supposedly alive for 400 years, you won't have to wait that long for for our review. It is coming up next episode, we promise. And more stuff on the way, too. So uh, stay tuned, and we'll see everybody the next time on The Further Adventures of Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones.